All right, let's get number 16. We'll begin at verse number 44 with your second hand. If you could get uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, please. Just for time's sake, we'll uh, find these references. We'll read them in just a moment. 1 Timothy 2 will be in verse number 5. And then with your third hand, get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll be in verse number 18. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 16 and verse number 44. 1 Timothy 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says in number 16, verse number 44, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Now let me give you a little bit of background so you know why he's about to say this. Uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram have just gone down alive or quick into the pit. They uh, tried to rise up and take over the priesthood, and Moses went out with censors, and God has proven who was the rightful leaders. The next day, the people, the congregation of Israel, blamed Moses and got everything all backwards and said that Moses had killed the people of the Lord in Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now God's a little uh, ticked off, we might want to say. In verse number 42, 43, he calls Moses and Aaron out to the tabernacle. His glory appears to them. And that brings you up to speed. Uh, the Lord spake unto Moses in verse 44, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire thereon from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now, they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Father, please, I'm not going to take long, God. I don't want to. I do want to respect that time, but Father, for whatever time we have here, I want to meet with you. I want, I want your presence to be manifested and be real. Please don't let me get in the way because that's what I do, God. I pray you'd cover me in the blood and I pray that the Spirit of God would just have liberty. Move about here, Father, and, and work in hearts and talk to people as, as you know they need. Father, please, I pray for a manifestation of your Spirit and your power this morning. Help me, I pray. Help these people to hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, this job here that Aaron has been thrust into, you must admit, this is, this is kind of a scary situation. Uh, this is probably something that Aaron wasn't ready for when he woke up that morning. I seriously doubt he had this on his agenda that he would be standing between the dead and the living. This is a pretty important job and probably not one that everybody would just volunteer for. But I do want to say this. If you have ever been saved and you've been born again by receiving Jesus Christ, whether you like it or not, you may not have had it on your agenda, you are in the same position as Aaron. You and I, as children of God, we are standing between the dead and the living. You are the middle man. Yeah. Now you say, well, I don't like that job. That's an important job. Yeah. I mean, there's some people that are depending on you to do that job. You say, that's a little bit too much pressure. There's probably somebody else better qualified to do the job. Granted, maybe one guy may be better than the other at doing it, but all of us have a responsibility Amen. to stand in between the living and the dead. Amen. Now take your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And a verse you know, verse number 5. Now, I, I, I would bring people up here, but just for time, you'll just have to kind of work with me here. I want you to pretend that uh, over here near this chair, this is God the Father. All right, now, right next to God the Father will be Jesus Christ, as it should be. And then we have a gap here, and all the way on this other side, we have a lost man. All right, so you have this picture, and you have a lost man here. We have Jesus Christ here, and then we have God the Father here. Now, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, in verse number 5, that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, I think you're familiar with that verse, and I don't think anybody would have a problem with that here in this church. You know that we have God here and the lost man way over yonder, and the only way that lost man can get to God or be reconciled, made one with God is to go through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he is the mediator, and there's no way to get around that or go over or under. You have to go through Jesus Christ to get to God the Father. I think we're all familiar with that, and if, if not, that's an easy enough thing. You, I'm sure you've understood that. Now, when you look at that situation, you say, well, you have a lost man here, Jesus Christ here, God the Father here. You got everything you need, right? But there's a gap. There's a gap right here, and somebody's got to fill that oh, gap. Yes, yes, now, yes. now, you say, but, but the lost man, Jesus, God the Father, that seems like that is enough to get the job done. What we're trying to do is get this lost man to God. Surely Jesus Christ can get that lost man to God. Yes, we know that Jesus is able to the uttermost, yeah. to the uttermost to save them that come unto God by him. Yeah. But what we fail to realize many times is there is a gap between that lost man and Jesus Christ. Now understand, Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. You understand that? Yeah. Between that lost man and God, Jesus is the only one that can get him to God the Father. But... The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a, a preacher? You see, in that gap, you have to have somebody standing between the dead and the living. You have to have somebody, a preacher, the Bible says, to get that lost man and to bring him to Christ. Then Christ brings that man to God. You say, man, that's a pretty important uh, job. That's an important position to fill. Uh, man, we better vote on that and find somebody in the church. That can... yeah. Brother, when you got saved, yeah. you signed up. Amen. You're in the gap. Yes, now it's just a matter if you are doing your job yes, or not. Sir, Take your Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5. Hold your place in number 16 if you haven't dropped it already. I should have told you that earlier. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and look with me. Well, let's just look at verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See, that's, that's salvation. That man's saved. Now, after he's saved, he's become a new creature. You're going to see in verse 18, 19, 20, he's in the gap. Verse 18, all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, look at it, the ministry of reconciliation. Who is the us? It's the anybody who's a new creature. Yeah, you have a ministry. You say, I just got saved last week. I don't know a lot about the Bible. You'll learn. Yeah. Stick with it. You'll learn. You have a ministry. Yeah. That ministry is to reconcile sinners, the dead, to the living God. Yeah. In order to do that, you have to get them there through Jesus Christ. Verse number 19. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, save sinners, the word of reconciliation. What is that word? That is anybody that comes to God through Jesus Christ, their sins are forgiven, they're washed in the blood, they're born again, they're a new creature. Verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors. He didn't say anything about getting a degree from any kind of Bible school. No kind of studying, no kind of voting needs to be done. If you've been a new creature, God's given you a ministry, He's given you the Word, and now He's given you a job to do. Amen. You are an ambassador for Christ. Amen. He says, as though God did beseech you by us. I have never heard of God begging for anything. God is beseeching people, Amen. and He uses us to do it. You know what God's doing? He's beseeching, please, please, come to me through my son. Yeah, and he's put that burden, that ministry, that word in us. Amen, we are Aaron, standing between the, the dead and the living. Yeah, he says, we did beseech you in Christ's stead. You see that right there? In Christ's stead, please be reconciled to God. Amen. You see, you say, well, Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth, he died for the sins of mankind. I mean, does he not have all power in heaven and earth? I mean, the Bible says he said that he does. Could he not do the job himself? Well, yeah, he can do whatever he wants. But he has left the job in our hands. He has sent us out and said, Hey, take that atonement, run, go get those dead and bring them to me. That's our job, that's our ministry, that's our office. 
That's our word of reconciliation. Come back to number 16. I want to show you a few things about this very important position about being the middle man, standing between the dead and the living. Show you a few things just real quick. Number 16, and in verse number 46, I want to show you first of all the motivation that we have to work in the gap. Standing between the dead and the living, there's something that we cannot forget. At the end of verse number 46, he says, For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. He said, The plague is begun. You, you, you and I as saved people, brethren, we have to keep it in the forefront of our minds, and sometimes it is difficult to do. I don't care if you're a pastor, missionary, preacher, what is it, whatever it is. Sometimes it is difficult to remember that the fire of hell is still burning even right now. It, it sometimes it's not a pleasant thought, but an important thought to remember that people are dying even as we are sitting here in an air-conditioned building. They are heading off into a crisis eternity and will burn forevermore. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. I mean, the wrath of God, brethren, is a real thing. He says to him that believeth not, he shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That thing is real. And brother, in this passage, what I think maybe it took about five minutes from the time that Moses and Aaron were on their face, Moses said, Aaron, oh man, God's just made it known to me what there's a plague going to hit. Go get the atonement fast. Run quick, Aaron, go. I mean, Aaron's hustling. And in a matter of about five minutes, God dropped 14,700 people. Brother, you better take the wrath of God serious. You say, well, I'm saved. I, I, I didn't want to go to hell, and that's why I got saved, man. I don't want to burn forever. I, I was scared of that. You know what Jesus Christ told his apostles? In Matthew chapter 10, he chose 12 apostles, and then he sent them out two by two. You know what he told them? He said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You know, gee, we, we use that verse for lost people. A lot of times when, when we preach, we say, look, man, you want to get saved because God can cast you into hell. That's true. There's nothing wrong with using it like that. But Jesus gave that verse to save to his disciples. He told his preachers, the ones who are standing between the dead and the living, he says, you folks, don't worry about what people are going to say or do to you. You better fear God. You'd better remember that God has wrath. Yes, sir, and that those people are going to burn and he's going to cast them into the lake of fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He said, you better remember that. You and I. The preachers, the ambassadors, we have to keep that in the forefront of our mind. You know why I like being involved in missions and I enjoy being involved in churches where they want to win souls? Because I'm glad that one day somebody reached me with the gospel. I can remember being worried and fearing hell. I can remember laying there as a 15-year-old boy. I had glow-in-the-dark rosary beads hanging on my wall. I would literally pray for three or four hours a night. I could do them by memory. Five st I could pray the uh, mysteries and all that stuff in the Catholic Church. I did it all because I was afraid of going to hell. Oh, brethren, I remember the day that somebody preached to me how my sins could be taken away and, and my soul was, was lifted and went free and, the, and I was washed in the blood. I can remember how wonderful that was. Man, I want to do that for somebody else. I can remember being on that side. I like it a whole lot better on the other side. And I want to be involved in missions, both, listen, here and abroad, it doesn't matter what country you live in, you die without Christ, you go to hell. You burn for, so wherever you are, it's good to be involved in something, missions, visitation programs, something where you're trying to get people away from the wrath of God. You have to remember that God has wrath. I'll tell you another thing, verse number 47, we see that Aaron took the atonement. It says, he took as Moses commanded, ran into the midst of the congregation, and behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. Now, you must realize that Aaron had to make an atonement. I want to tell you this morning, thank God you and I don't have to make an atonement. Amen. I'm glad, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that the atonement has already been made in our place. Amen. Bible says, and not only so, but we joy. We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. You see, but the, to atone or to make an atonement is something that satisfies wrath. 
the wrath of God has gone out. And Moses said, you need to get an atonement. Well, brethren, when the truth of the word of God goes out and that lost sinner realizes that he's going to burn in hell, he needs to find an atonement. And I'm glad this morning that we have the word of reconciliation. We have the knowledge that Jesus Christ, when he died up on that cross, he made the one and final atonement for the sins of all mankind. You see, in that Old Testament, they offered up the blood of bulls and goats, but the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. That's an animal. I'm not an animal. I don't care what they teach you in schools. I'm not an animal. I didn't come from an animal. That animal's blood can't save me. But when Jesus came, he came like a lamb because he's picturing that sacrifice from the Old Testament. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That blood of bulls and goats, it wasn't enough. So God had to come to this earth like a man, walk this earth for 33 years as a man, and then die as a man. And like you have properly presented here with the sins of all mankind on it. And he paid for our sins. He satisfied the wrath of God. The Bible says in Isaiah, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. When God saw what Jesus Christ did in dying on the cross and paying for my sins, he said, that's enough. That's the payment. Now, if anybody wants to be saved, all they have to do is receive what he has done. Man, thank God he made it easy. Thank God it's paid for, brethren. That's the word that we carry to this guy, and we show him the cross. We show him nothing more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. We say, look, the debt is paid. The sin is canceled. You you can enter into heaven freely through Jesus Christ. You can get to God. Brother, that's a a wonderful atonement. That's a wonderful message. That's pretty good news. Now, because... The wrath is real because the atonement is even better, (laughs) makes the story even sweeter. I mean, the wrath is true. You need to know about that. But man, I wouldn't want to preach about the wrath if we didn't have the atonement. (laughs) But man, I'm glad I know about the wrath. Jesus' atonement saves us from the wrath. But did you know all of that is useless? If this middle man doesn't run with the message? let's, Let's look again there in number 16, verse 46. He says, t- Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go how? He said, go quickly. He says in verse 47, Aaron took as Moses commanded and what did he do? He ran into the midst of the congregation. Brethren, you've got to realize, you have to remember the wrath of God. We have to know that there is an atonement that satisfies that wrath. Thank God for that. But all that's useless if there aren't people standing in the gap running quickly that have some zeal to get that message and that word of reconciliation to that dead man and bring them to Christ. I like that story in Acts chapter 8. Philip, he's preaching great revivals in Samaria. I mean, people by the dozens, by the hundreds maybe getting saved. And then the Spirit of God calls him out and says, Hey, Philip, I want you to go to the backside of the desert there. One little black man walking around down there. That's your target. That's the man I want you to talk to. Boy, most American preachers would just say, I don't, that can't be the Spirit of God telling me to run away from a revival down to one little black man on the backside. Not Philip. You know what the Bible says he did? The Spirit of the Lord came to him and said, go join thyself to his chariot. The Bible says he ran. He ran, man. He was excited. Why? He knew that the wrath of God was real. He knew the atonement was, was able to satisfy and save that man. He said, that little guy on the backside of the desert needs to hear it. And he took off running. Now listen, I'm not not telling you to be stupid. I'm not telling you to kick open doors so that you can preach. I've seen guys do that. Literally. I've seen them knock on a door and if somebody doesn't answer the door, they open the door and walk in. And say, hey, I'm here from Bible Baptist such and such. Boy, you're going to get shot. I'm going to be in the car. I'll call 911. You're going to get shot. You need to be shot. That's just dumb. You know, in a black neighborhood, nonetheless, he needs to be shot. I told them that. <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to be stupid. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. It's good to walk in wisdom toward them that are without. But listen, redeeming the time. I'm not telling you to rush and push things ahead of God's timing. But when you have an opportunity, 
When the door opens for you to witness to somebody or get that dead to the living or to help some missionary so they can get the word of reconciliation on to somebody else, brethren, when the door is open and the opportunity is there, you need to start running. You need to say, God, thank you for this opportunity. Let me do all I can do with this situation. And don't tell me you don't have opportunities. The problem is you're not looking for opportunities. Lost people walk past you every day. But we're not ready. Don't have the tracks. We're not loaded. We're standing in the gap with our thumbs in our pockets just whistling victory in Jesus while other people pass by and we can't help them. I remember one time Malawi had a, that Dixon Lungu, my first convert. He'd come down with bad kidney infection, went to the hospital, went to visit him, finally had to take him to a different hospital, got some care. He came out all right. A couple days later, he said, Brother Mike, he said, uh, my, I think it was his aunt, or maybe been a cousin or something. They're, they're relatives. They never know quite who's what to who. But he said, my, I think it's my aunt. He, she's in the hospital. She has AIDS. It doesn't look good. She's probably going to die. Could you visit her? I put it off. I said, yeah, I'll visit her. But I said, man, I'm kind of busy. I'll get to it when I can. And I put it off. Week went by, I put it off. Another week went by, he said, have you visited? I'll, I'll get to it, I promise. I put it off. And then one day he said, Brother Mike, please, can you go see her? She's not doing well. I said, let me go. I went up there. I don't, Mrs. Lungu, all I know was her name. I talked to her, she was lost. Talked with her for about 35, 40 minutes. She got saved. We, we, she knew that she was under the wrath of God. She heard about the atonement. She came to God through Jesus Christ. You know what? A couple of days later, after she'd been saved, she passed on into glory. Now, if she meant business, and if she was serious, she's up there with Jesus right now. Thank God for that. And you can say, thank God you reached her in time. Yeah, but brethren, what about all those other ones that I didn't run so quickly to get? What about all those opportunities that you've been procrastinating on? Mm-hmm. You know, I believe there's probably a lot of people in hell today for one reason, procrastination. Yeah. Maybe on their own part or on your part. Yeah. Come on. Maybe they were ready and you didn't get to them. Can you imagine Aaron running quickly? He has the incense, he's put the atonement on, and the Bible says he was standing between the dead and the living. Well, what, were you, what, what would you do if you were that one guy on the living side, the last one that he, I mean, the last one to get saved, quote unquote, from that plague. Can you imagine the thanks that you would have? Yeah. Come on. Imagine the joy, man, oh, I, I barely got in. I was on my last, my, that was my last hope. I, I didn't have anywhere else to go and I, I barely got in. But what if you were this guy? The one guy that was saying, Aaron, hurry, hurry, Aaron. I don't have much longer. I wonder how Aaron felt as he stood between the dead and the living. He could look here and say, thank God Mrs. Lungu got in. But boy, there sure are a lot of other ones that I missed. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I wonder today if you would search your heart and say, have I done my very best job at being an Aaron? Now, you know the beauty of this story? If you, you can always be Aaron. You should always be Aaron. You should always be trying to bring the dead to, to the living God. But listen, you can also be Moses. You see, because there are some times where you can't reach these ones in Malawi, Mexico, Chile, wherever, uh, China, wherever they are. You know what you can do? You can be Moses. Moses sent him. You see, how should they preach except they be sent? If you cannot be Aaron in a particular situation, be Moses and send him out. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's stand, stand with our heads bowed. Father, bless the word as it's gone out. Might it please bring forth fruit that's pleasing to you. Multiply the seed sown in Jesus' name.